my interactions with an artist on social media shouldn't be buy my music i've got a new single out i've got a new video out that that isn't going to engage that, that that is marketing versus like i said when you go at it from a branding perspective and actually it's an extension of who you are and what you're interested in Hello there, welcome to another Music Ally Focus podcast with me, Music Ally's editor, Joe Sparrow. And in this episode, I'm extremely happy to welcome Katura Cummings, the founder CEO of Forward Slash, a social media agency which specializes in connecting artists and brands with the younger generation of fans. So we spoke about tapping into youth culture from a music perspective. So how should we market towards this generation of fans in an increasingly direct to customer environment? And how should we connect with this younger online audience, which is extremely sensitive to authenticity and realness when they consume their online content? Katura explains everything in just a minute. Now, if you're not familiar with the Music Ally Focus podcast, we look at one uh, very focused topic at a time, hence the name, and it's going to be quick. It should take about the same amount of time as our old friend Andre Ortolf could hypothetically move 40 kilograms of ice cubes with his mouth. Andre moved 1.5 kilos in one minute in 2017. And if you're thinking about attempting to break that record at home, it's important to note that Andre attempted that record using 25 milliliter ice cubes. Now, talking of lip service, Generation Z music fans are able to immediately sense when an artist's communications with fans are inauthentic. But of course, marketing has in its very nature an element of inauthenticity. So how do you maintain authenticity or a believable facade of it when marketing to them? And what are the needs of this young online only generation? And how can artists and teams market effectively directly to these younger fans or potential younger fans? Let's go and talk to Katura right now. All right, I'm very happy to welcome uh, Katura Cummings, uh, founder CEO of Forward Slash the podcast. Hello, Katura. Hi, Joe. Thank you for having me. Uh, great to see you. Um, now, we're going to be talking about something which applies to everybody in the music industry, wherever they work, really, which is marketing and communication and connecting with a young audience. So it's really the lifeblood of the music industry, so no pressure. Um but um, before we get started into that, can you just give us a bit of context, please, who you are, what you do at Forward Slash, and what Forward Slash is? I guess first and foremost, I'm a music lover. My career so far has been rooted in music and sort of wanting to showcase and share music, which is what really led me into marketing. Outside of Forward Slash, I am a DJ. Uh, I run a music label called So Future, and its focus is on uh, black electronic music in underground scenes I had a stint at bbc radio one one extra as a social media producer and then i left and was freelancing as a social media consultant and then eventually ended up starting forward slash we are a 360 social marketing agency and a content production studio and then in addition to that we also have forward slash academy which is an education platform which is specifically focused at uh, emerging independent artists and creators to kind of equip them with the skills to build their own brands and sort of grow digitally um, because I'm quite aware that not everybody has the resource to be able to bring in an agency so the opposite side of what we do is empowering and educating people. So all artists are keen to tap into whatever the current youth market is but that has changed and is changing rapidly and seems to be sort of in some ways not fragmenting, but settling into niches and areas and communities. So from your perspective, what does that younger market look like in 2024? How do you define it? And what are their unique needs now? I think what connects them is their behavior specifically where we're talking about social and digital media. That's, what I guess, what makes them a youth market, in my opinion. It's really just they have been the end of you know millennials and the beginning of Gen Z that have been through this development of technology and social media and that's really shaped their behaviors and the access that they have to each other and to information and that's really what i guess to me makes them a youth market but if we're talking about marketing uh, music marketing as a whole yes you want to focus on the youth but in general we're, we're trying to reach audiences you know whether that is um classic fm or six music or it is radio one you know there's a, there's a whole spectrum there when we're talking about music marketing so i think in, in 2024 specifically, I, I feel like the, the focus has to really be on breaking that down and segmenting and not just looking at this monolith of 
um, youth audiences and really looking at what those characteristics are. So when you're marketing your music and you're trying to pull your brand together and you're trying to figure out who your audience is, you have to get specific. I don't think we're, we're in a position where we can just be like, all oh, young people. Is that a hard thing to communicate when you're working with clients then to say, okay, we're going we're gonna to get very, very niche. We're going to focus on these small groups. And the, is that also difficult? Because every little group needs to be super served in a certain way. So is that, has this segmentation, this sort of self-segmentation made things harder or easier, do you think? Um, I think it's both. So we have, like I said, artist clients and brand clients. So on the brand side, we work with like the BBC, Radio 1, One Extra. Uh, we did a campaign with Netflix last year. Uh, we do some work with Amazon Music on helping them to build out one of their playlist brands. So I think it actually looks quite different depending on whether you're dealing with an artist or a brand. I think what you refer to really, in my experience, has been with brands and corporations and them looking at, I guess, balancing their involvement and being able to offer their products and service in this market, whether that's the streaming platform or whatever that service is, as compared with um, the bottom line and trying to make revenue. And I think a lot of times in the pursuit of revenue, you want to do this, this catch-all. You know, you don't want to do the segment. You want to just hit as many young people as possible because that will help you. You, you feel like that will, or they feel like that will help them hit their revenue targets quicker or, yeah. you know, that's the best way to do it. So the difficulty can be trying to get them to narrow down, okay, yes, your your streaming platform or your playlist or whatever can serve this mass of people, but... You know, for example, if we're talking about um, a black music playlist, okay, well then there are many, many subgenres in black music. Are we talking about yeah. uh, rap? Are we talking about, you know, Afro beats? Those are slightly different audiences as well. They might have crossover and they enjoy these, those kinds of music, but how you speak to them and the cultural touch points that you use to appeal to them will be different. So th there can be a challenge in terms of getting brands to think about, it's, it's not like hyper segmentation, but really just thinking about you don't necessarily have to, try and target everybody in the first place. I think really think about how, who your product speaks to or your service. Young communities have always segmented themselves, but but really we're seeing a hyper-segmentation in the sense that people are really going into small communities, albeit they're enormous because they're international as well. Yeah. Um, so they're sort of, there's lots of them and, and, and they're quite large, but in one location, maybe not so much. But how are the needs of young audiences different to previous generations and what has influenced those needs? Fundamentally, even if we take it away from music marketing, I don't think the fundamental needs have changed between generations. I think, you know, everybody's looking for belonging, acceptance among their peers, to be able to live out their dreams, to leave their mark on the world, food, shelter, water, like those are the basic things among every, amongst every generation. I think, again, what we when we talk about now, the difference between this generation, it's the advent of the internet and social media and now access to that information and the way people are able to express that. And now they're sort of, this generation has a demand for, well, if you don't meet my need or your values don't align with mine, then I can't play ball with you. I think that's that's the difference now. Right. They're able to be a lot more vocal about that and express that. And now it requires brands and corporations to actually take their cue from the people that you're trying to target. You don't get to dictate to them how this goes. If you, if you want to play ball, you kind of have to do it by their rules to a certain extent because they, they're now in a position to be very clear about, you know, what they want. The, the, the idea of cancel culture on the one hand or, you know, this like, um, hyper fan culture on the other side, these fandoms, like people are very are able to be very vocal and say what they like, what they don't like, what sits well with them, what doesn't, what they're interested in, what they expect, you know, and I think it's it's a brand job. Uh, music marketing, whether it's an individual as an artist, but more so from a music brand perspective to respond to that in the ways that make sense to the audience we're trying to target. Does that make things... Does that make things more complicated in a certain way? Like you said... There's something interesting there, which is the brand can no longer dictate the needs of the of the audience, which of course we know happened in the past because mm. it, it was a very one way system. Um, do brands, or you know, not even you know, we say brands, we may, we're talking about um, artists and, and artist teams, as well. labels, the yeah, streaming platforms, yeah. Like, do they struggle with a sort of the element of like, let's say, humility of saying we're going to listen to the audience first and even though we want to do this, we won't do it. 
ultimately, I think all of this conversation actually really leads to a central point, which is mass and micro are not what is going to work in 2024. It really is about niching down. Um, so from an artist perspective, it's about you being confident and comfortable sharing who you are as an artist outside of the music, because that's what's going to attract your tribe, your quote unquote tribe. Um, it's not just, I think the, the, the idea that now we've got socials and, and, and artists can reach audiences easier. But on, on the one hand, of course, that's true. But there's still that distinction between social media followers versus fans. So, you know, at one point, it's like get as many followers as possible because that will get your music further. Well, now 100,000 followers actually doesn't equate to 100 fans. So people that are going to buy your music are going to, without prompt, share your music, are going to show up. The shows are going to, you know, all of the, the things that you're doing to, to build your music unit, uh, your brand universe, they're going to be a part of that versus someone who passively follows you on social media. You could have, you know, 90,000 passive followers and 10,000 followers, uh, mm. actual fans. Mm. So I think mm. ultimately it still comes back to that thing of how, from an artist's perspective, how do I communicate what I'm about, what my values are within, in, in and outside of music to connect to the actual fans and not mm. just this this big audience yeah. on, so, on on socials or online. So th that sort of brings us quite nicely to my, my next question, which um, is direct to customer or direct to fan. Now, throughout the music industry, from DIY artists to superstar artists, managers and artists, they're increasingly focusing on direct to fan as a not just a strategy, but like the mm -hmm. business model that that that. that, that, that building their business around. They want to own that data. They want to connect directly to those fans on platforms and channels that they control. Mm -hmm. um, and this is completely in line with what you just said around understanding the market, understanding the, the fan base and going into that niche. So what can artists and their teams do to effectively market to those fans directly? So I will keep making the distinction between like branding and marketing in the sense that the brand is who you are, what you stand for, your music, and the marketing is really just how you communicate that. So in this rise of like director, consumer marketing, ultimately it's just different ways to convey your message, different ways to build your communities, whether that is you know, like the the Patreons or the subscriptions or whether that is merch or whether it's a Discord channel, like these are just now ways to grow that. And and I use the, the term brand loosely because I think we're also now in an era where everything needs to be a brand, everything needs to have an Instagram page, everything needs to, you know, it doesn't necessarily, but from, from an artist's perspective, it is essentially who you are as a person, your brand, your music, what that is about. And the marketing is really just the way you get to communicate that and, and make those those make sense. So when we're talking about how can they do it effectively, I think fundamentally, again, it comes to understanding who your, your you know, you could pick five typical members of your audience. Are they people that like to communicate one-on-one -on -one through the discords? Are they, you know, people that maybe don't want to be that hands-on, but are cool to like receive emails from you or text messages? Like what, what are their, habits and, and what what are they what are their what are their ways of communicating and really tapping into that and then I think in terms of what you offer how do you think about what would make it exciting to be part of your fan base so is it the fact that actually there is you've announced a new project and the fans have the opportunity to hear some of the demos or they get to help you pick a track or there's a remix that you're considering, like how, what ways can you bring them closer to what you're doing? And I think what I kind of have a bit of a push and pull against is like, that's not everybody's personality and that's not the way everybody yeah. wants to operate as a musician. And I understand that. And I think it's trying to find that balance between what makes sense for you and your team and resource and what you've got available versus you know, trying to fit in with, as we said, what the market demands, like how are people expecting for yeah. you to communicate with them? What, you know, where, where can you find them? Where can you meet them? How do you meet them where they are? So I think there's, there's always going to be a little bit of push and pull there and you have to figure that out for yourself. But I think 
what the internet um, and these online platforms and social media has given us is that opportunity to have that conversation. You don't actually have to know the answers. You can really just ask the question. You could ask them directly and they will tell you. So from that, you get to build a picture of, okay, well, this is what we can do. This makes sense. If we have, you know, this limited edition merch or these collectibles, we know that this is what they want. They're interested in this, you know, they'll buy into it. And in that way, you sort of do grow this community. And again, I feel like community has fallen into the category of, one of those words that have been very overused and nobody yes. really knows what they mean when they say community or authenticity or culture. A lot of these words have just been thrown around now and I think we're kind of maybe losing the meaning, but that's, that's by the way. Yeah, well we'll, we'll, we'll we'll touch on that in a minute. When you're working with an artist then out of interest and you're looking for, let's say, a sort of communication strategy for, for those audiences, there's a lot of pressure put on artists to be everywhere you know like oh you, you all these different platforms to communicate with director fan with all these things and that, obviously that's impossible it burns them out it's not healthy sure. for them how do you navigate that in terms of saying okay well, we're we, we want to connect with these fans directly we want these young fans we want to use the thing that is authentic to their experience of how they want to connect with you mm-hmm. but we don't have the capacity to do all of them so we're, we're going to say no to some stuff that's the kind of thing that sounds like a conversation that doesn't go down very well with some people how does that happen how does that work so interestingly there is always it's, it's always an interesting conversation to speak to the artist the manager and the label yeah and ask them all the same questions and get three completely different answers and you start to see where they're not really aligned on how this should how this should go how they should roll out you know what the artist wants to do so from a, um, an agency perspective we're always trying to find the middle ground most of the time the label is the client you know they're the paying client but the artist really is the person that you need on board you need invested in this so i think in the first instance it is the acceptance that you can't be everywhere you can't be on all platforms at all times and i think to really do a good job of nurturing audiences and communities you probably have to choose two and well which ones you choose that then comes back to the artist to their personality what are they comfortable with do they actually want to be on camera on all the time are they happy you know participating in tiktok challenges and that kind of stuff or are they a little bit laid back and actually they would be way more comfortable just uh putting a gopro on the ceiling in their studio and you know mm. from that we we cut up some footage of studio sessions or you know kind of documenting their process so i think really it has to start with what the, what the artist wants to do what they're comfortable with um and even if they're not that's a, a part, another thing that we do as part of force academy is like that, that training and on camera confidence and really getting people to understand how platforms work so they feel a bit less nervous about it so i think that's the first thing really because that's the only way you're going to be consistent and that's the only way it becomes part of your you know your routine or what you do week to week or month to month without it being a chore and something that eventually they're going to lose interest in yeah and that brings us then on to where the responsibility lies because you know realistically a a an artist needs to communicate on multiple platforms but they them the person can't do all of that there has to be spread amongst the team and that's why mm. artists have teams right now you mentioned the word well we've all mentioned the word authenticity ad nauseum you know it's, it's <laughs> everywhere and um but that idea, while it is overused, like you say, that idea of authenticity or, or the feeling of realness in that connection with the artist, is, it seems really fundamentally important, to, especially to that younger demographic. That it, it needs to feel right, you know? Of course, when you talk about marketing and its nature, it is inauthentic to an mm. extent because you plan it out, you, you hope to have calls to action and outputs from what you put in, right? So there's a, it's a tricky balance there. How do you maintain that feeling of authenticity for that audience when you're doing the communications with an artist, let's say? I think the strategy has to be, has to include a willingness to share, like I said, beyond the music. So my interactions with an artist on social media shouldn't be by my music. I've got a new single out. I've got a new video out. That that isn't going to engage like that that is marketing versus like i said when you go at it from a branding perspective and actually it's an extension of who you are and what you're interested in when when it's in, in that sense it it's less about a hard sell and more you know this artist is also a great chef apparently or you know 
they are interested in crocheting or making uh, custom, I don't know, scarves or cushions, like that, that's an extension of who you are. And, and that is an, a really easy way for your audience to get to know you a little bit better without it necessarily be, it doesn't have to be super personal. You don't have to start talking about, you know, what's happening in your family or the deep, dark, in the inner workings of your psyche that's not necessarily what brings authenticity it really is just about being willing to share the other parts of your life outside of music or what inspires the music so what then your strategy becomes is uh, music interspersed with who you are your personality a more holistic view of of who you are as a person because again social media that's what we're trying to do we're trying to keep the social in social media so there has to be an element of being able to understand or get insight into who you are as a person, your world, you know, what makes you tick. So that's an interesting point, isn't it? Where the the person, the artist, and what they do and say and are outside of their music is it feels increasingly important. Um it's always been important, right? We've we've always wanted to know what some most musicians like some of them we want the facade of you know the the iconic uh, facade and we the want mystery the and mystery yeah. right there's some people but for a lot of them we want that direct connection but if have you noticed that that has become as social media has become more entrenched increasingly important because it sort of feels like artists we need we need to know a bit more about them outside of their music i think the yeah the natural um evolution of social media or well not natural i guess what we're seeing now to be the evolution of social media almost feels like it demands that and it it's a requirement of being an artist or being visible you know people feel like they have the right to have this access to you and i, and I do think again it's still for you as an artist to create those boundaries so what what are the things that you're willing to share and that's why i'm saying when you look at your strategy as just an extension of who you are, what you might do on day to day versus feeling like you have to overcommit with, you know, all of this really personal information. You being a fan of Formula One or I don't know, you enjoying skating, like those are really easy things to just share with people without it feeling like it's too much of a drain on you or there's too much demand on you to, you know? Yeah, I was going to say because you know, one of the classic responses when you're working with artists if they say well I, I want my music to communicate everything you know I, I want I want it to say everything and, and and you know that's you have to negotiate that on an individual basis of course what are those conversations like do, do you do you do you often meet sort of a bit of a wall of like oh, I don't really want to share anything and then you sort of have to chip away at it and say well hey look you like you like you like darts you can talk about that that's okay you know yeah, I think a, a lot of that sort of resistance really comes back down to the anxiety that people have around socials. And, you know, now like the value of someone's music is is caught up in these metrics. And artists often are a little bit nervous about doing that because if it doesn't, you know, quote unquote, go well, or if there aren't big numbers, then that apparently yeah. is a reflection of the value of their music or them as a human. And there's lots of things that are connected to that. So I think there's an element of understanding that but what we try and convey and try and find the middle ground of is the the way things are right now it really is out of sight out of mind you know mm. we are constantly competing for everybody's competing for everybody's attention brands are competing for attention from other creators from influencers from mm. um you know the person in their bedroom making funny videos we're just constantly competing for attention so there is an element of out of sight out of sight out of mind and that doesn't mean that you have to be always visible and always present but i think uh, it was easier it was previously easier like uh, uh, sometimes we deal with we work with artists and they'll reference someone like well you know frank ocean is barely visible on the internet mm. yes now but yeah. back then he was big on tumblr and he was active yeah. on twitter now he's in a position where he doesn't have to do that so we're in a different time i think it's getting artists to understand that and figure out what are the things we need to do to build their confidence to make them comfortable to find a middle ground between, okay, there's not a lot you want to share. And and if you don't, and if you feel very strongly about maintaining that air of mystery and then letting your music do the talking, okay, well then we have to delve deeper into the music, into the lyrics. And actually that could be a source of content as well. Right. There, okay. there are other ways around if you, 
you know, absolutely, completely sure that you don't want to share anything outside of the music, then that, yeah. then we use the music as our inspiration. That becomes the basis for the content strategy. And that's when you earn your money uh, to uh, figure <laughs> that one out. <laughs> so it, it can be a challenge, but we, yeah, we'll get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I will uh, put some links to forward slash and to so future as well. Uh, yes, thank you. One final question, uh, Katura, is, um, which is music related, uh, just to get a bit of a grip on that with you. If you could pick only one piece of music, it could be an album or it can be a, like a, maybe a playlist, but one piece of music, one thing that you would only listen to for the rest of your life, what would it be? Oh, that is so unfair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That is so unfair. Uh, I'm just going to have to say it just because I've been listening to it this week. And okay. actually, I also... Uh, I've included in a recent DJ mix, uh, okay. Sade Smooth Operator. Right. Uh, just, and I have, you know, moments where I'll like go deep into like 80s and 90s. And then other times it's like something that came out, you know, in the past year. I'm like, I'm just mm -hmm. uh, interested in the, the, the DJ mix that I put out recently is really exploring like this culture of remixing and edits that on one hand is getting a bad name, I guess the way it's used on TikTok, but what a remix can do in terms of how it can put it, add a different uh, flavor to a track. So actually this Sade track is from 1984's Move Operator, but there's a remix that I've included in the DJ mix, which is from, I don't know, 2020. And yeah, yeah. actually what that can do in terms of bringing new audiences to older music, how you can yeah. combine sounds and genres and, you know, just thinking about all of that. So I would just have to say, I'll, I'll put enough. a link to that below the podcast as well. And interestingly, I, I've never been a huge, um, Charlie has never been really part of my listening experience, but I heard a great remix of one of her songs last year. Oh, and nice. It, and it stood out. I can't remember yeah, which yeah. one it was now, but it, you're completely right. It really worked. And then reworked it in, in a way that made me appreciate Charlie for the first mm. time. That you're, you're proven completely right. that. Nice. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, Katura Cummings, thanks very much. Thank you so much. Take care, Joe. Thank you again to Katura, and if you found that useful, please do share the podcast on with someone else who you think will get something out of it. If you want to get in touch with me, I'd love to hear from you. My email is joe, J-O-E, at musically.com. Don't forget, we have a free weekly email called The Knowledge, which comes out every single Friday and rounds up bits and pieces of the best analysis, news, marketing insight, and skills from across Music Ally's broad range of services. Sign up using the link below the podcast and impress your boss. That's it. Thanks for listening. I've been Joe Sparrow. You have been you. And until next time, farewell. Farewell.